So hopefully that's given you a kind of an idea that maybe it's not all the doom and gloom that, um, that you see in the news, but it is actually, um, there is still potential for Icelandic volcanoes to have a big impact. And so the last part of the talk, we'll just run through um, some examples of that. Basically looking, first of all, at explosive eruptions and then at, um, at effusive or lava ones. So for explosive eruptions, we're going to talk two, about, two eruptions of Hecla, Hecla 3 and Hecla 4. And these eruptions took place um, around 3,100, around 4,200 um, years ago. Those are the carbon dates. And these are much bigger than Eifiat the Occult. So Eifiat the Occult was a third of a cubic kilometer. These things here are um, 9 and 12 cubic kilometers. So these are much bigger. These are pinatubo-sized eruptions. These are, are big things. And like most of the explosive eruptions, like Pinatubo, for example, these would have happened really quickly. So these would have put out um, millions of tons of material per second um, over a very short duration and dumped it all very quickly. To get an idea of the scale of these eruptions compared to Eifiat the Occult, this diagram here, this photo here, shows um, the Eifiat the Occult ash layer at a location about eight kilometers downwind of the, of the volcano. Um, and you can see here this light gray, you can see there's maybe about a centimeter of ash that we've got there. In comparison, if you go and look at the Hecla 3 deposits about nine kilometers downwind from Hecla, then it looks like this. Um, we've got four meters thick here of pumices that are ranging up to about 50 centimeters in diameter. We've got lumps of lava and rock which are about 10 centimeters in diameter. And the whole thing is so big, you can see here with the bulldozers, this is because the Icelanders are actually quarrying this material because they can take it, and because it's so light and got all the bubbles in it, they use it to make insulating plasterboard. But the deposits of this are so huge that you can see um, that the contrast is just, is just massive. The same thing happens if you look at the areas. This yellow um, area here is where the Eifiat, the Yoko 2010 eruption, covered with about one centimeter of tephra. That's Hecla 4. 80% of the surface area of Iceland. So it's a much, much bigger eruption that we're talking about. It's a kind of totally different um, kettle of fish. And you can also see that this stuff had an impact on Europe. Because if you go through soils and you go through peat bogs and you go all across Scotland and Ireland and all into Scandinavia, and if you take the, the peat, for example, and you take it to the lab and you dissolve away all of the organic material and you look at what's left, then you find ash grains. And so you can see the ash grains here, you can see the bubbles in them, you can see how the magma was foaming when it, when it came out. And these eruptions basically are covered all of, all of this area of northwestern Europe. The really important markers, um, if you're doing climate work or if you're an archaeologist and you find a deposit, then you want to know the age of it, then you know that if you can find Hecla 3 or Hecla 4 tephra in your, in your layers, then you know the date of that instantly. So they're really important dating tools. So these are clearly very big eruptions which have definitely deposited stuff all across Europe and they've got potential to affect Europe in the future. They've got potential to close down huge areas of airspace and stuff like that. And so the question is, well, if we had an eruption now, what, what would it be like? And actually, just now, we don't really know. Like there, there, we don't have enough data to make a, a good estimate of what it might be like. That's what um, my current project is, is about just now. So. I was at a talk this morning, people were talking about fieldwork and the importance of introducing people to it. Well, I remember when I did my standard grade geography, I went out and found evidence that Glen Clover in the Scottish Highlands was a glaciated valley. And since then, it's been scaled up and scaled up until in summer 2012, I did this expedition where I went all over Iceland and I was trying to find samples of the Hecla 3 and all the Hecla 4 eruptions so that I can reconstruct them and find out what they were like so that we can, uh, can predict what a future one would be. And that involves going all across the country and digging into the soil. And in the soil, you can see lots of ash layers. You can see that's Hecla 4, and that's Hecla 3. And in each of the layers, you measure the thickness, and you measure the size of the grains, and you take a sample away for more analysis. And you make little logs or little notes um, describing all of the bits there so that you can find them again, so you can compare them to other things. Over the course of 2012, I went to 341 locations, 460 samples, and you can see all of the material that I've got here. You can see how widespread these layers are. This is the kind of work that it's going to take to work that stuff out, and this is still a work in progress. Um, there's still um, got more field work to do this summer, and then lots of these samples still need to be analyzed. But in terms of a, of a summary or of the early findings, then it turns out these eruptions are actually quite different. So people lump them together often. They just say, oh, these big Hecla eruptions. But Hecla 3 was uh, 
really powerful. It can produce really foamy, really big light pumices. These things here, that's about 50 centimeters, so it's bigger than the size of your head. Um, whereas Hecla 4, this stuff is much finer grained. When you go about 100 kilometers away, you can see that the Hecla 3 stuff is kind of like coarse sand. The Hecla 4 stuff is, is really fine and silty. And that's interesting because if you're thinking about um, hazards and you're thinking about coming to Europe and you're thinking about what's going to stop the aircraft, it's the fine and silty stuff that's the lightest and the finest, so that's the stuff that's going to go the furthest. So it's important to understand these kind of things if we're going to understand the likely impacts of these big explosive eruptions. One of the things that's also quite interesting, if you imagine that these layers here, a few centimeters thick, have covered all of Iceland, is what's going to happen when the wind blows. This picture that we've got here was taken um, last September, and you can see an ash plume extending from Iceland south across the Atlantic towards the UK. Which volcano is it coming from? Well, none. It's coming from the Sandur deposits, which are the flat plains along the south coast. And this is remobilized ash. That's ash from Eyjafjallajökull, the Yokut, and it's ash from Grimsvold. And it's just getting picked up by the wind, and it's getting blown across. So if you imagine a Hecla 3 or a Hecla 4 eruption where you've covered the whole country with this stuff, and it's all getting blown around, then you could see that this is going to be a problem for, um, for years or decades to come after the eruption. Okay. So for my ty final type of eruption, we're going to have a look at a large magnitude fissure eruption. So these are the big basalt eruptions. We looked previously at the, the big rhyolite. These are the ones that are, the magma is really sticky. But when you've got the runny magmas, then you get these large magnitude fissure eruptions. The most famous example of these, the most recent one, is the, the Lackey eruption of 1783. When you look at a fissure eruption, this is a picture um, of Hawaii. And basically what happens is the ground just splits open and magma just starts spraying out. And it sprays out and it lands and it forms lava flows and the lavas then flow away from the crater. And in the Lackey eruption, you can see here, this is the, the Lackey crater row. It basically opened up a series of fissures over the course of about eight months that covered a length of about 27 kilometers. So that's basically halfway from here to central London of all these fissures opening up. And when each fissure opens up, the material to begin with, they could have been spraying to nearly a kilometer in height. So this must have been a pretty spectacular thing to have seen. And another way that you can think about it to look at the scale of this compared to other eruptions, now you can barely even see this, but this little orange smear down here is the Fimbordelhaus lava, which I showed you, which was the thing that came out at the start of the Eyjafjallajökull the Yokut eruption. And to put that into context and compare that to Lackey, Lackey looks like this. So it's uh, much, much bigger compared to 0 0.002 cubic kilometers in Eyjafjallajökull. the Yokut. Here we're talking about 14.7 cubic kilometers of magma coming out here. And it's covered a vast area all the way down to the, nearly to the coast around the town of Kirkjabar Cluster of 565 square kilometers. So this is a, a vast eruption. The thing that's interesting is this went on for a long time as well. This eruption took eight months to go on. And during this eruption, you would have fissures opening and then um, erupting and then more than the fissure and whatever. And if you think about what this would mean for air traffic, Basalt eruptions don't normally make much ash, but on the other hand, if the fissure goes through a lake or if it goes into a glacier, then you would get some. And so you would get sporadic closures. You would get little clouds coming out just for a day or two, but um, individually might not be much, but there would be lots of them, and you wouldn't be able to predict when they're, predict when they're going to happen. So that's going to cause chaos if you're trying to um, be working out what you're going to do with your aircraft. In terms of it being there, though, having seen that picture, you think, wow, that's amazing. I would love to have been there to see that, to see this whole thing, just a sea of moving, living, hot magma, hot lava. But, um, but actually, um, the more you read out about it, that actually you wouldn't want to. The conditions of nice disruption would have been brutal. So during the eruption, 60% of the livestock was killed and 20% of the people died. It got so bad that the Danes who owned Iceland at the time considered evacuating the whole island. It was really, really nasty. Really, really nasty place to be. And you can actually get um, really good descriptions of that by an eyewitness. So this guy here, Jon Steingrimson, was the pastor in the town of Kirkjabar Cluster at the time. And he wrote up lots of notes about what the eruption was like. And he's painted a pretty, a pretty horrific picture. So he described the lava flows in his classic droll Icelandic style as smelling as if burning coals had been doused with urine. And then 
once the lava kept flowing, or as the lava kept flowing, what was the real problem with um, Lackey, though, was the toxic gases. So as well as all the magma coming out, it's got a lot of sulfur dioxide, it's got fluorine, it's got chlorine. In particular, the fluorine's really bad. Um, you get poison called fluorosis, where the fluorine dissolves your bones away, and it's, it's really nasty stuff. On the symptoms of this, he wrote, these people who did not have enough older and undiseased supplies of food to last them through these times of pestilence also suffered great pain. Ridges, growths, and bristles appeared on their rib joints, ribs, the backs of their hands, their feet, legs, and joints. Their bodies became bloated. The inside of their mouths and their gums swelled and cracked, causing excruciating pains and toothaches. So these people are kind of trapped here. This is a fairly remote place. And you've got lava coming down one side and down another side. It's not easy to get away from. So this is a pretty grim situation to be in. And of course, all these people, they were living in an agricultural society. Once the animals start to die, and if your crops are starting to fail, then you start to get hungry. And so it led to a famine too. And in the famine, he said that people got so desperate that they cooked what skins and hide ropes they owned and restricted themselves to the equivalent of one leather shoe piece per meal, which was sufficient if soaked in soured milk and spread with fat. So this is a pretty grim situation that these people have found themselves in. So having read that, then I'm thinking, well, maybe I wouldn't actually have liked to have been there for that. And actually, it got pretty bad in Europe too. So um, the pollution came over and it caused this haze fog, which was like a dry fog that covered most of, um, most of southern England and France and everywhere like that. And because this fog was acidic, then it was basically like acid rain. So when it fell on the crops, it caused them to shrivel up and it caused them to wither. And, um, and so it would have damaged agriculture. And people have said, well, perhaps this could have killed tens of thousands of people during this eruption. So it's a really serious situation. And so then you've got to think, well, what would it be like if it happened now? And actually, we're starting to get an idea of this. So this eruption is much more recent. It's been studied in much more detail. And people have started to do simulations of what this eruption could turn out like. And it turns out that um, the pollution would be bad in a current eruption in Europe as well. So this is some photographs from group in Leeds. So Ken Carlslaw here and Anya Schmidt, who's um, done a lot of the modeling. And this shows a typical nice spring day in Leeds, or around about Leeds. And it's looking at the pollution, the atmospheric pollution. So this concentration here is um, PM 2.5. So these are 2.5 micron particles. And you might have been familiar with this 2.5 data during the last few weeks when we've had the pollution in the UK. So Anya basically ran the lackey eruptions through um, models to see what it would be like. And she's basically found out that across most of the UK, the pollution level is going to go up by between 20 and 50 on the PM10 scale. So that basically means that a nice spring day in Leeds starts looking like this, and you've just got this haze being like this. And unlike the situation that we had in the UK a few weeks ago, which went on for a couple of days or a week, this situation would have gone on for months. And also, unlike the situation in the UK a few weeks ago where the pollution was lots of industrial stuff and soot and nitrous oxides with a little bit of, uh, of desert sand thrown in too. This is sulfuric acid that people are breathing in. So it's going to be hurting your lungs and it's going to be hurting your eyes. What Anya did then was she took equations that people have developed for seeing how atmospheric pollution corresponds to death rates from people with heart attacks and cardiopulmonary things like that. And she basically worked out where people would die. And this is the map that she's come up with. And she predicts that if we have another lackey type eruption, then you're talking about having an extra 10 or 20,000 people dying um, across the, the southern and eastern parts here. And in total, the best estimate is that 140,000 people extra would die because of, because of this type of eruption. When you look at it here, this is a combination. The concentration gets lower, but the population is obviously bigger down there. So that's why these areas are lower. So this is a serious, a serious problem, a serious type of eruption. Um, in terms of what this would look like, it's interesting because, um, the, for example, in the pollution last week, people would have died then, or last month, people would have died, but you probably didn't see it. So generally older people or whatever, and this might be the same situation here, but it's definitely something serious that people are going to have to worry about. You also have to worry that if we have um, the sulfur dioxide coming down, if we've got the acid rain and it destroys Europe's wheat harvest, then the knock-on prices for that, not only about Europe, but the effect on the global wheat price and then on the world are also going to be interesting too. So these are definitely something that people need to think about. In terms of how likely this eruption is, we've only had two eruptions this size in the last thousand years. Um, you might get another slightly smaller um, fissure eruption, so maybe one cubic kilometer as opposed to 14 or something like that 
every 250 years. So it's, it's the kind of spacing that you're thinking. We're not talking Yellowstone. Yellowstone, forget that. It's once every half a million years. So it's like reasonable time scales, 250 years. But it's, again, it's not going to happen tomorrow, or it's hopefully not going to happen tomorrow. OK. So in summary, um, basically, the aviation rules are as important as the eruption duration and the style in determining how much the flights get affected. On average, you would expect an ash cloud in the UK every two weeks. And the largest eruptions that you get can affect European populations and agriculture. So there is something to think about. And so I'm doing this, I'd like to thank people at Edinburgh Uni and the BGS and the Met Office in, in Iceland who I've worked with. And um, I'd like to thank WGEC for inviting me along to, to give this talk as well. OK, thank you. Yes, so this PowerPoint is going to be available on the WJEC website. And some of you might have a handout. I don't know, the handouts ran out, but um, that will also be on the website too. And so that's, yeah, so that's got a list of um, things that if you're teaching classes about volcanoes, you might find useful. A couple of things I would highlight on that are the British Geological Survey's My Volcano app. So that's a pretty nice thing to have. Um, I, Volcanoes Top Trumps as well. There's a Volcanoes Top Trumps game which has been put out. That's pretty good. And that's been organized by a project called the Strava Project, which is really focusing on volcanic hazards. So that's a good thing for crossing over into human stuff. So it's like the real transition between the physical and the human stuff in that Strava Project. And then there's a list of blogs you can look at and people who you can follow on Twitter as well. Okay. <laughs>